My next guest was a salon employee, a cosmetologist making about 18 an hour with income limitations. She decided, let's start my own business. So she went all in with no backup plan and no savings. And within a year, her income went up to about 80,000. She then discovered that she can achieve fire much faster by investing in real estate. So what she did is she learned to optimize her salon. Get this, she only works about three days per month and makes about 8,000 in net profit. But what's really exciting is what she's doing with real estate. She started with single family, but she learned that multifamily is where you really wanna be. So in this episode, she talks about who she partners with, what kind of properties she's looking for, where she looks for those properties, and some potential revenue she can generate. This is a good one. If you feel like you're limited in your career or income potential, or you wanna fast track your way to financial independence, this is a great episode. Please welcome Jesse Dillon. Jesse, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. So why don't you kick us off and tell us about your background? Yeah, so a little bit about me. My name is Jesse Dillon. I live in central Massachusetts. I'm 31 years old. I'm a wife, a parent, um, a yoga enthusiast. But um, not here to discuss any of that today. I also am a beauty business owner and a real estate investor. So bringing it all the way back to 2017, I was working um, at a big box beauty retailer doing education. I was really passionate about what I did, but ultimately it came with all of the downsides of retail management. So the pay, the hours, the commute, um, none of those things were ideal. And I had started a family. I just had different priorities. And I realized I needed a way out of that because there wasn't as much room for growth as I was promised originally. So summer of 2017, I took this crazy leap of faith. I learned a new service in the beauty world. I had my cosmetology license from long before then. And I started doing this work on the side directly with clients And soon my days off were packed with seeing clients one-on-one doing beauty services. So come fall 2017, I actually quit my job with no plan. Um, I'll never forget calling my husband and telling him that I did that. And he was like, you know, it'll be fine. Like, we'll figure it out. Um, So I left my full-time job on a whim. We had no savings at this time. There was, we were very much paycheck to paycheck. Um, But I just knew that it was going to work out because I was at a point where my full-time job was actually preventing me from taking more clients on the side. So I was at that, you know, point of constraint where I had to get rid of the day job to create more opportunity for myself. Fast forward to summer 2018, I had built up a name for myself. I really fell in love with the business side of offering beauty services and entrepreneurship Um, And I had to open a place of my own just for more space, more freedom, more control. I had been renting at an existing business up until then. So at this point, it was just a year later and I had doubled my income. I was working significantly less. And since then, I have just been building up the beauty business, going through tons of changes. The structure of the business has ebbed and flowed. Um, You know, I went from having employees and apprentices to renters um, to developing an online business mentoring program for other artists when we had to close down during COVID. Um, That was a huge success. But ultimately, a couple of years ago, I realized I can't do this forever. I was working in the business Mm -hmm. at that point quite a bit, like it ramped up and there was really high demand for what I was doing. And I was having really bad body pain. I realized I did not have the freedom that I got into entrepreneurship to have. It was quite the opposite. So I realized I need a way out. I need to kind of create my backup plan here, my escape plan. I actually discovered the whole fire movement in a Facebook clickbait article. So I was scrolling through Facebook And there's an article, I think it was with Business Insider and Millennial Money Honey, who's on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And the tagline was something about retiring at 26. So I'm like, that sounds great. So I click that and I'm reading through it. And it was basically just about aggressively investing in index funds to achieve early retirement. And at that time, 
I was making so much more money than I had ever fathomed making. Um, it was a far cry from what I was making, you know, in retail management. So I was comfortably living off like 30% of my income. So I was able to invest 70% in index funds, but I realized that was still going to take me 11 years. And I just, there's no way I could have kept up that pace for 11 years. But one podcast led to the next, and I heard someone being interviewed who is instead achieving early retirement through real estate. And I was like, you know, according to this guy, anyone can do real estate and you can achieve work optional status a lot faster. It would also make me more time independent and location independent. And those two things are part of my big vision for success. So this was only two years ago, just over two years ago that I heard that podcast. So we're talking fall 2021. Mm -hmm. I dove into like every book, every podcast, the coaching calls, the boot camps. I was just consuming as much as I could for a couple months until it all started to sound the same. I realized everything was starting to become redundant. I was just looking for these golden nuggets. So that's when I knew I had to stop consuming for a little bit and actually just start taking action on what I was learning. So November, 2021, I made an offer on my first investment property. This is while we were still renting. I actually was a renter through my first two investment property purchases, which is funny. So since then, I've bought four investment properties. I've gotten into wholesaling real estate. I'm down to working just one day a week in my beauty business. And Mm -hmm. I have a great team of renters in place who take care of clients every other day. And um, over the next year, year and a half, I should be able to achieve my real estate goals, make the beauty business completely passive um, and achieve that time and location independent status that I'm looking for. Love the journey here. And I love the leap of faith. You were backed into a corner. You didn't have a choice. You had to do this. Yeah. And I think it was a little easier because at that time, we very much, my husband and I, we did not have golden handcuffs. We didn't have super high paying jobs. We didn't have an inflated lifestyle. So even if I did kind of fall on my face, it really wouldn't have been a far Mm -hmm. fall. And I think that made it a lot easier. I love that. Nice. All right. Let's get into the numbers a little bit. Um, Are you willing to share what your income was when you were working for um, uh, for somebody else? Yeah, when I was at that beauty retailer, I was making eighteen an hour. Oh boy! Okay, Mm -hmm. I was also driving an hour each way, so that was tough. Oh my gosh! Okay, so then when you you went into business, you started your own uh, salon. It sounds like Mm -hmm. is that correct? Yep. And then what? After a year, what did your revenues get up to? My net income, even after taxes, in the first full year in business was 80000 for that year. Nice jump. Okay. And then I assume it kind of, did it continue growing after that over the next year or two? It did, yeah. I mean, the more I pulled back with clients, I was willing to take a little bit of a pay cut. Mm-hmm. Um to get some of my freedom back at a certain point. So there was a point where I was like, you know, making as much money as possible in this is no longer as important to me as it is to kind of get some of my freedom back, my time. But there was a time, I would say like when the business was generating the most money, it was coming heavily from me doing services and from the business mentoring program that I developed online. And I think our net profit in those higher months was around 25000 Per month. Mm-hmm. That's great. Okay. So the mentoring, is that like a course or coaching program? Yeah. So in the beauty industry, it's a lot of people who are just really passionate about what they do. Like you mm-hmm. can be the best, you know, hairstylist, lash artist, permanent makeup artist, but a lot of these people have no idea how to build, how to build and sure. sustain a successful business, how to market their business, how to connect with potential clients and be discovered. So that's kind of why I developed that program because there were a lot of artists who were really not that good at what they did, but they were very successful because they were great business people, vice versa. Mm. So I had always wanted to do it. And then 2020, when we were forced to close the salon for three months, I finally had the time to do it. So I developed that program. um, 
And then shortly after I added on an option for one-on-one coaching monthly. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Now the program, is that like a, like a membership or like a one-off purchase course they could take? Yeah. So the first round, we actually created the course live. So it was a live program, a six month program that people would sign up for and pay in monthly installments. Now the course, all the recordings, all the content is just evergreen. Um, And I no longer take one-on-one coaching clients. Good for you. Very leveraged passive income. Excellent work. Um, And what do you charge for the program? 1325, I believe it is now, or maybe 1349. Okay. Uh, 1349. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got just it. a one-time payment. Got it. Yep. We see a lot of courses that can be as low as like a few hundred bucks on up to like 2,500. So that falls right pretty much in the middle. So that's great. Um, all right. So you start, you, you learn to scale your own practice, become more efficient there. You have the leveraged income with courses, and then you move to real estate. So mm-hmm. let's talk about that a little bit. Are you focused more on single family, duplexes, multifamily? What's your specialty? I did start off a little bit smaller. So I started off with a duplex, a single family, and another duplex, um, all in my area. So Massachusetts, you know, it's a higher cost area. So Mm -hmm. getting into those three properties within eight months, I was pretty tapped out capital wise. So I really had to pivot after that. That actually inspired me to open my mind up to partnerships, which is something I was really resistant to before that because I had built the beauty business alone and that worked out really well for me. So I once I opened my mind to partnerships and really figured out, all right, what can I bring to a partnership? And then what am I looking for someone else to bring to the partnership? Um, it was easy to reach out and find that ideal partner. So now mm-hmm. going forward with partnerships, um, the sweet spot for me is like 10 to 20 unit value add multifamily properties nice. out of state. Nice. Okay. So with some of the partners, are they just like, individuals like yourself, maybe an entrepreneur, they have some capital and you come together. Or are you talking about maybe a like a like a business you'll partner with? Um, not so much a business. I really like working one-on-one with people. So okay. um the partnerships that I've done in the past, the one that I'm working on now, and the future partnerships that I'll be doing um in a perfect world are two individuals, myself and one other partner, where they understand the wealth building power of real estate, but they don't really have the time or knowledge to invest on their own, but they do have the capital and they want their capital to work harder for them. Yeah. Whereas I bring to the partnership, the time, the knowledge, the experience while they're bringing the capital. And I love to find the right partner first, really feel each other out, really bang out all the details, um, make sure our goals are aligned, the vibe is right. And then go out and find the ideal property for us because the person that I'm working with is really more important to me than how good of a deal we can get together. Sure. Well, let's dive into that a little bit. What are you what are you looking for with a partner? And what are you what are like red flags you want to avoid? Um, red flags, like I I think a big one is someone who would want to micromanage my portion of the deal. So mm-hmm. like you know, the day-to-day work that I'm going to be doing, it's ideal for me to work with someone who is truly just too busy to even think to micromanage that and who really can see what I've done so far and put their trust in me with the project. Um, I do obviously provide like really thorough updates for my partners, mm-hmm. but um, it's important to me to work with someone who doesn't micromanage. Um And of course, like honesty, transparency, really feeling like we're in this together and we're always going to be looking out for each other's best interests. That's really important to me. Gotcha. I love that. You you want somebody who who is so busy, they're not going to bother you and start asking questions, (laughs) get in the mix. And I've got this. Let me be. Just you go do your thing. We got this under control. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Do you have a yeah. team of people that like works with you with real estate? Or is it really just you? It's mostly just me. I do have okay. two virtual assistants who are amazing. Um, yeah. One of them does like more repetitive stuff, and one's a little more high level. Who's been with me since 2018. Um, they're both U.S. based. I know a lot of people talk about going overseas for VAs. I have tried that. It really wasn't suitable for me, but. 
Um, I love my VAs. Um, and they actually help with a lot of stuff in both businesses. So anything that's repetitive or I can spend 20 minutes teaching someone how to do it, that's something for them. Sure. Gotcha. Just to take a, a step back here, so I'm clear, you you work about one day a week with your salon. Is that correct? Mm, yeah. And what are the what are the revenues on that? I'd be very interested to hear. Like one day a week, time investment. Let's see what those revenues are. Yeah. So last month, I'd be inter- I'd be interested to actually look back and see how many hours I worked. Um, I probably did three full days last month, and okay. my net profit from the beauty business as a whole was about eight thousand. So that also includes profit from the renters, like the other girls who rent space at the studio. Got it. Got it. Okay. I'm just curious here. How many other uh, women rent space in the studio? Um, Handful? Five. Five right okay. now. Yeah. And okay. they each do one or two days. Gotcha. Okay. That's pretty good. Very leveraged there. Again, like I said earlier, and then with real estate, it sounds like you spend probably the other four weekdays strictly on real estate. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say I usually, I mean, my workday is probably like four hours because that's okay. just like, you know, I start to run out of steam after that. But um, yeah, I do that's spend great. most of my other working hours focused yeah. on real estate. That's um, the only work that I have to do really for the beauty business outside of when I take clients myself is um, every month I just do a promotional campaign through text and email marketing. Mm-hmm. And figure out what kind of education I can offer the renters the following month. So those are really the only office tasks that I have to do for that business. This podcast episode is sponsored by Ticker. Ticker is a platform that helps you manage your own investments with confidence. Check this out. Let's search for Apple. You can see Apple is on sale. That's looking good. Score 61 out of 100 and margin of safety is 75% higher the score, the safer the investment, and the higher the margin of safety, the higher potential returns you can make. In this case, you can see the share price is 175 as of the recording of this video, and the upside potential, the fair value is 398. All right, let's look at a different stock. We'll go to GameStop. In this case, GameStop is overpriced, scores 39 out of 100. That's not looking too good. And the margin of safety is 0%. Here are some other features within. You can create your own custom dashboard. I like to set up and take a look at the top gainers and losers in the last 24 hours. I also like to take a look at the top search stocks, but you can really customize the dashboard to whatever you want. We have stocks, ETFs, crypto. This is a big one. We have a watch list tool that allows you to add stocks to the watch list. And if anything changes, such as that score or margin of safety, you automatically get notified. I call it the the set it and forget it feature. And then we have portfolio trackers and alerts. So if you're looking for strong stocks, want to avoid bad stocks and learn how to invest, I invite you to join Ticker for free. Let's get into the strategy of real estate. I've I've had a lot of real estate investors on the podcast. They will target specific areas in the US, sometimes locations that are around hospitals or universities. Um, uh, sometimes working class, sometimes they go to the suburbs. So what's, uh, what kind of areas are you looking at? Yeah. So my personal strategy going forward is long-term rentals. Um, so for me, I think a lot of my peers who go around hospitals and universities, they also use the midterm rental strategy. I use that in the guest room of our home actually to help bring down our mortgage cost. But as far as, um, you know, bigger multifamily projects going forward, I just go for long-term rentals. I really like working class areas in um, bigger cities. So right now I'm investing in Chicago. Um, A lot of people would call them like C-class neighborhoods. Um, And I think that's a really, a really sweet spot for us. Nice. Yeah. Let's dive into that because it's been a while since the classes were defined. I have had other guests that talked about B class as being really good. A few people talked about C class. Um, So why don't you define what that is for the audience real quick? Yeah, I think everyone would probably give a different answer. Okay. Um, But my personal thought would be an A class neighborhood is all single family homes on the higher end. A B class neighborhood is mostly single family homes, maybe a couple multifamilies. And this is like just neighborhood to neighborhood. 
A C-class neighborhood, I would say, is all multifamilies, but relatively safe. A D-class neighborhood is going to be all multifamilies, a lot of properties that are vacant, boarded up, distressed, um, right. possibly a higher crime rate. Gotcha. Okay. And I've had guests on the show that have talked about how long it can take if you use the strategy of going single family to single family to single family. Well, it sounds like you graduated past that pretty quick, which is good. Moved to duplexes. And then you said earlier 10 units. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, the last property that I bought, which was with a partner, I was mm-hmm. 13 units in Chicago. So okay. we each own half of that deal. It's a value add project. So the there's a lot of deferred maintenance. The rents were under market. So it'll take probably one to two years to really get it to where it should be. Um, but yeah, I knew that to achieve my monthly income goals, I was going to have to have around X amount of units, right? And I personally hate the unit count metric. I think it's a vanity metric and it really doesn't mean a whole lot and can be misleading. Um, But I knew, okay, if I own something like 50 to 80 units with partners, so I I have like a true net ownership of half of that, right? That will just about get me to a point where my rental income is more than covering my monthly expenses, my living expenses. Um, So that's kind of my number. And I Mm -hmm. knew, okay, if I want to buy 50 to 80 rental units with partners, I can either do that in like four deals or I can do that in 80 deals. (laughs) Right. And it's kind of the same amount of work, if not way more work to do it in, you know, 80 deals. So rather than going for death by a thousand paper cuts, (laughs) I figured I need to figure out how to just do bigger deals so that I can do fewer of them and get to the finish line faster and easier. Yes. I love it. And then do you try to look at like a a average like dollar amount per renter? Because if you do the math, like let's say you've got 50 to 80, you split that in half. So you're collecting in revenue against 25 to 40. What's your kind of minimum amount you want to be making per unit? I like to, I prefer to only look at deals that if the property was optimized, like once the market rents are achieved, expenses are brought down as low as they can be mm-hmm. reasonably, with each unit cash flowing at least 500 a month, that would be an idea, a sure. great deal for me. So if I'm collecting 250 of that a month, 250 times, you know, 50 to 80 units is pretty good. That is pretty good. I was just doing the math here. You know, 500 times 25, you've got 12,500, split that in half. Um, still, 6,000 is pretty decent. But if you you get to like that range between 50 and 80 at 25, you split it at that point. You split the 50 and you take 25. You know, you're taking over 12,000 in passive income mm-hmm. per month. That's, that's solid. Way to go on accelerating to the larger... Uh, properties. I found that a lot of people, pretty much almost every real estate investor on this podcast has talked about the starting point, single family, but everybody's graduated to larger complexes. So yeah, great work. Yeah. And you know, I think um, owning the 13 unit, for example, it actually feels a lot safer to me for a couple of reasons. It's less scary to me. Reason number one is when you buy a commercial size multifamily, so anything that has five units and up, the lender typically will make you have a professional property management company in place with a signed contract before closing. So you know that the the, the building's going to be professionally managed. So that's one thing that's helping you. Another thing that's helping you is um, you're almost diversified. So if you have a single family home and you go two months without a tenant, you're in the red probably a lot. And some people can handle that. Some people cannot. With a 13 unit property, if you even have a couple of units vacant, you're still probably going to at least break even. So it's actually a little less scary to me for that reason. Yeah, that's that's smart. And great call on the property management company. I know people who try to you know, maintain the property themselves. You know, they get those calls on a weekend or nights like, hey, toilet's not working or this this issue's happening. Oh, it's just a nightmare. Um, so with that in mind, property management fees, we usually find on the podcast between like 8% and 15%. What do you usually run into? 
I would say for a long-term rental, that's pretty high. Um, okay. Right now I'm paying 6% in Chicago. Wow. And I know that in like Boston, Massachusetts, for example, 5% is pretty common because the rents are so high. Um, That's but great. something else to note too, like I think a lot of people put property management in place and think that makes real estate passive. And it really doesn't because you still have to play the asset manager role because no property management right. company is ever going to care as much about your investment as you do. So you really do have to be on top of it week to week, month to month to make sure that you know, everything's running how it should be. Sure. So you've only been investing in real estate for, I'm doing the math here. Are we talking like three, four years? Two years. About? Two years, just two years. Yeah. Way to go. Okay. In the two years, any major lessons learned or major headaches you ran into? Um, those two are one in the same. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. but you know, the biggest lesson was just that it's never going to be perfect and you are getting paid to deal with the headaches. Like that is your job is to put out the fires and deal with the headaches. It's never going to be just easy and seamless and nothing goes wrong. It's normal for stuff to go wrong and it's normal to be stressed and upset about it when things go wrong. It's just par for the course. So I think that was the biggest lesson for me. When I bought that first duplex, um, there was the basement flooded, like maybe a, a month into owning it. And it was just because the ground was frozen and then it got super hot and it was just like a, you know, freak thing that happened. But oh my God, I was horrified. And I think I was so upset because I just wanted to be a good landlord. I didn't want them to think that, you know, I was not taking it seriously or not addressing it quick enough. I just really wanted to do the right thing. And I kind of didn't even know what the best way to handle it was in the moment. So it was super stressful to me, but I figured it out. And now I know for next time. So that was my first taste of like, things are going to go wrong and you'll always figure it out. Set expectations up front, like real estate is not perfect, can be very passive. A lot of people that achieve fire use real estate. It's a great play. Yeah, but there are headaches along the way. You just got to be resilient. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, awesome. Um, let's dive into the rapid fire round next. This is part of the episode where we get to find out who Jesse really is. If you can, try to answer each question in 15 seconds or less. You ready? Yep. All right. So what is your favorite podcast? The Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. All right. So what is a recent book you read and would recommend? In the Flow, specifically for women. Okay. Never heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So we get a movie question here. What is your favorite movie? This is not going to be the most eloquent answer of everyone on this podcast, I bet. But my favorite movie is Hot Tub Time Machine. Seriously. I love that movie. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> One of my top five comedies. It is hilarious. Yep. Rob Corddry. <laughs> Love that guy. All right. We could talk all day about that. Um, <laughs> all right. Next one. What is the worst advice you ever received? That I would be an idiot to buy a property that I've never seen in person before. Wow. I'm sure you've received that a few times. Yep, yeah. I have. <laughs> All right, flip that equation. What is the best advice you ever received? That you only quit if you stop. Or I'm sorry, you, <laughs> you only, only fa fail. you only fail if you quit. Yeah. Yep, yep, that's a good one. I've heard that too. All right, and last question here, time machine question. You would get this one. <laughs> All right, if you could go back in time to give your younger self advice, what age would you visit and what would you say? I think I would go back to my high school self, maybe just graduating high school, and just say that all the twists and turns are going to make sense. They don't need to make sense to you right now, but they'll always make sense in retrospect. So just trust the process. Love it. Great advice. All right, Jesse, where can people reach you? Instagram is my where I hang out most. So on Instagram, I'm Jesse Dillon with an underscore at the end. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. This is great. Yeah, thanks for having me. We'll see ya.